So you just got your first camera and you're thinking, now what? When it comes to photography, there's so much to learn. Like anything in life, you've got to start with the basics. For photographers, that is taking full control of your camera. Today, I'm going to teach you how to shoot in manual. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy content about photography and videography, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to stay up to date as I'm constantly putting out new content. I know when I got into photography, my biggest goal was to never lean on shooting an automatic. I've always liked the challenge and like hopping on a bike without training wheels. I picked up my camera and never let the dial move from M. Your camera is a tool and you're able to get the most out of it by using it to its full potential. Like a carpenter with a table saw, they're most efficient when they're able to understand every aspect of its use. For us as photographers, that's learning how to shoot in manual and at first it can be a very daunting task. Not only are you learning how to use the functions of your camera, but understanding concepts that are core to photography. But my hope is that it's easy to understand after watching this video. Shooting in manual means you have full control over your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. These three are better known in the world of photography as the exposure triangle. They all work together to control how much light gets through the lens and camera to the sensor or film if you aren't shooting with digital. Today, we're only gonna focus on how these three work together with digital cameras as it gets a little bit more confusing when you venture into the film world. Understanding the difference between the three of these for beginners can be pretty confusing. So I wanna break down each one in a way that is easy to understand and how they all work together to create your final image. Aperture. Your aperture is the one member of the exposure triangle that is located outside of your camera and in your lens. A device called a diaphragm, which is made up of several blades, opens and closes, letting you allow or limit the amount of light that passes through your lens. It works in a similar fashion that the pupils in our eyes work. The more light that is present, the smaller our pupils become to block out the excess light in our surroundings. The aperture not only controls the amount of light allowed through the lens, but the depth of field you will attain in your photograph. Depth of field can easily be explained in this set of photographs. As you can see in this first photograph, the bell is the only thing that is in focus as the background quickly blurs behind it. This is known as a shallow depth of field, meaning that the focal plane for what the camera can focus on is narrow, not capturing more than maybe a few inches or feet in focus. This is useful if you're capturing a portrait and you want a clear separation between your subject and the background. In this next photo, you can see more of the images in focus. This is what is known as a large depth of field. Adjusting the aperture on the lens allows you to choose how much of your scene you want in focus. And with a larger depth of field, you can allow more than just your subject to come into focus. You may be asking yourself, which setting is going to give me a shallow depth of field and which setting is gonna give me a larger depth of field? In the world of photography, these settings are measured in f-stops. Each lens is made with a different amount of f-stops, which determine the different kinds of depths of field you're able to capture with that lens. This chart is a great way to understand and get a visual of what different f-stops represent and how your aperture looks in your lens when they're opened or closed to that specific stop. In order to gain a more shallow depth of field, you are gonna want your f-stop to be as low as your lens can go. For instance, in this test shot, I had my Sigma 35mm lens opened all the way to 1.4, which is the widest my lens aperture can go letting in the most light and creating a very creamy depth of field, better known as bokeh. Now to get a very large depth of field, I cranked my lens all the way to f16, which is the smallest I can make my aperture on the same lens, which now gets almost everything you see in the photo in focus. Today, we aren't going to dive too much more into aperture, as that could be a whole video on its own. Like I said, we're only going to touch on the basics. Shutter speed. Your shutter speed is pretty simple and straightforward in its name. It's the amount of time that it will take for your shutter to close in front of your sensor, capturing your image. This is measured in fractions of a second. And when you get into long exposures, it's then measured in seconds and minutes. The longer your shutter is open, the blurrier your image will be if your subject is in movement. To give you an example, in this image, you can see that because my shutter speed is slow, the cars are caught in this unique motion blur. But when my shutter speed is much faster, you are able to stop a moving vehicle as if it's not moving at all. For most of my photography, I try to keep a fast shutter speed. In portrait work, my shutter speed is usually around 1 200th to 1 320th of a second. If my subjects are moving, I may bring it up to 1 500th of a second. 
to make sure I'm not getting any motion blur in their movement. If you're trying to capture something that's moving really fast, like the Jeep I showed earlier or a basketball game, you're going to want to aim for a shutter speed of around 1 800th of a second or 1 1000th of a second. A good rule of thumb is to never shoot with a shutter speed lower than 1 60th of a second when you're shooting handheld. This is that threshold where the motion blur that we discussed earlier will start to get introduced into your images. Most long exposure work is done on a tripod. So if that is your goal, you'll want to make sure you get one and I've actually linked a super inexpensive one in the description below. ISO. ISO in digital cameras can be considered the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light, but it is way more in depth than that. The higher your ISO, the brighter your image becomes. But with that, you also start to introduce artifacts and grain into your image. On a normal sunny day, it's recommended that you keep your ISO as low as possible and adjust your aperture and shutter speed allowing for the sharpest image possible. If you're shooting indoors and there isn't a decent amount of light, then it makes sense for you to start to bump up your ISO. But depending on the limitations of your camera's ISO, you may be causing more harm to your image than you are helping. In these three images, you can see the difference between using a low, medium, and high ISO to capture a well-exposed image. At face value, they seem pretty okay. But if we zoom into the sign in the background, you can see that as the ISO is increased, the distortion and grain drastically reduces the quality of the photographs. Now that you have an understanding of how these three functions on your camera work, let's see how they work together. When you start working with the exposure triangle to capture a photograph, it's going to take a lot of trial and error. For instance, when I'm doing portrait work, I try to keep my aperture as low as possible, usually around the 1.4 to 2.8 range. Now when I'm letting all of this light into my camera, I have to make sure that my other settings compensate to cut out the extra light to expose my image correctly. This would mean that I would have to have a faster shutter speed and my ISO would have to be as low as possible. Now when I'm shooting a landscape and want to have more of the image in focus, my aperture will need to be higher, around 5.6 or 8, meaning my shutter speed will need to be lower without crossing that 1 60th of a second threshold that we discussed earlier. If doing those two things still don't give me a bright enough image, then I either need to place my camera on a tripod or bump up the ISO. If you've been paying attention, then you notice a pattern we follow when adjusting our settings. First, you decide the depth of field you need and set your aperture. Second, you adjust your shutter speed to either cut out extra light or allow as much light in as possible. And lastly, you either leave your ISO alone or you bump it up to make up for the absence of light. Remember, ISO should always be your last resort to getting your image the way you want it to look. Once you can balance these three things, you are on your way to mastering photography. Although there is much more that we can go over when it comes to photography basics, this is enough to get you started. As I create more content to help you on your journey, I'll make sure to update the pinned comment below with a link to my photography basics playlist. So make sure to check that out. I hope I was able to bring some clarity to you guys about shooting in manual and look forward to seeing you guys in the next one.